Hi, Kinesiology 3010. Today we're going to talk about reliability and validity. Um, we'll go into more on norm referenced and criterion referenced in some future videos. Um, but today we're really going to talk about reliability, validity, and objectivity. A reliability is the consistency of a measurement or the repeatability. So how well you can repeat that test and measure what you're trying to measure. Um, validity gives us the truthfulness of that measurement. Does that measurement measure what we think we're measuring and what we want to measure? Um, and lastly, objectivity. So this is how reliable we can be within um, different observers. Okay, so am I going to score a test the same as someone else? Um, the skill and the repeatability within individuals or between individuals um, that are giving that test or administering that test. Okay. We need to have reliability, objectivity, and validity to have a quality test or a quality measurement. Um, so these are important concepts. We, we want to know that when we measure something, we can repeat that measure. Um, so we're not, we're not having too much variance within our participants, within the measurement itself, and reducing that error. Objectivity, making sure that we are measuring what we think we're measuring and we're not having something else influence that measurement that's not what we're trying to measure and that we are measuring what we're measuring we can trust that that test measures that quality um, that which we're, we're trying to measure okay um, without these okay, we, we fail to have a quality test um, which which limits the the scope of that research because what we're measuring might not be measuring correctly um, and we might not have the repeatability if we administer the test again are we going to get some very different answer okay, if we look at the trustworthy of a measurement okay, we, we look at this in, in different aspects so like in daily life we want to know that maybe our blood tests or x-ray tests um, some kind of medical test that you may have is that test measuring what we think we're measuring okay, is that blood test accurately measuring um, your micronutrient content, accurately measuring your platelet count. Is it accurate when it comes to what we're trying to measure? Um, can we trust it? Okay, we look at that with peer reviewed research, especially in exercise science. Um, so all these articles you've been reading, we talked a few about validity. A few of those articles actually looked at is, is this test valid? Um, or is it, can we trust that what we think it measures actually measures that quality? So think back to that medicine ball throw test, we were looking at the validity of the seated medicine ball throw compared to a um, test of muscular power using a force plate. So is this other measure actually measuring the power that we think it's measuring? Um, and we can look at it with program um, design, um, treatments, feedbacks for, for someone who's maybe a personal trainer, physical therapist. Is that program that you're implementing trustworthy is it going to cause what we think it's going to cause <clears throat> okay we can look at reliability also with some other tests so here's an example with um, the sat so we're looking at reliability here so is it repeatable um, so if i take that sat in two different time points in october i take it and i score 1530 and then in december i get an 1890 okay what could cause those differences is this test reliable because when I administer that test again at a different time point, I'm getting a very different answer. So there, there can be some error, there can be some other interference within those two time points. So, so is it consistent? In this case, it's not very consistent because from time point A to time point B, I have very different scores. Okay, so think of reliability as consistency, repeatability. Um, are we able to reproduce the same value or the same measurement if we measure at different time points. Um, so will I score the same today as I will tomorrow in the morning compared to the evening? Is it reliable? Is it repeatable? <clears throat> so think of this as consistency, dependability, accuracy, stability. Okay, this is this is keeping that test is it's going to measure that same quality in the same way. And we're going to achieve a very similar answer regardless of when we administer that test to that participant. Okay, so we're, we're looking for consistency within multiple measurements. Okay, 
reliability coefficient similar to our correlation coefficient. Okay, we can use the correlation approach or our Pearson product moment correlation coefficient to determine reliability. So test A and test B, are they achieving similar numbers? Okay, we use that same value, we use the zero to one scale, we're not looking at, at negative there because we're looking at the same exact measurement, we're looking for a positive correlation. So if I score well on the first test, will I score well on the second test? Okay, a test with a coefficient of 0.8 or higher, they think of that as a strong correlation. Um, 0.8 or higher claims that we have good reliability, less than that is not good reliability. So think back to those other papers that you read, um, if they're looking at the reliability of the tests, strong reliability or good reliability is normally above 0.8 in that correlation coefficient. Okay, um, and then we have two different types of reliability. We have intra-class and intra-class. Okay, um, so looking at between tests and within multiple tests. Okay, what we'll most often use is inter-class reliability. Um, where we use our Pearson product moment correlation coefficient to analyze the consistency or the reliability of that measurement. So think of it as test retest. Um, we can use it with um, exams and things like that. So those of you who want to go into physical education or teaching, okay, we, we would use this with our exams or with, with testing protocols. So is test A the same as test B? Are they equivalent? Are they reliable? Is someone going to score a high grade on test A and a high grade on test B. If we have very different numbers, we know that test is not reliably measuring the knowledge in this case. Um, so one test may not achieve the same score compared to the other, but if they have high reliability or good reliability, we know that those two measures are consistent. We can use both of those measures. Um, we can also use a split halves, so have odd and even questions um, and looking at two questions that would measure the same knowledge attribute. Okay, so maybe your ability to um, calculate a T statistic or your ability to define test or measurement, uh, two different questions that would assess that. We can have our odd and our even questions. Each one is measuring the same quality, just using a different question. We want to know, are those questions reliable? So those who take the odd exam compared to the even exam, are they going to achieve the same knowledge base score? Okay, so this test retest reliability, this is what we do before we study. Okay, before we create a study, we need to know that our measurements are reliable. Um, that if I test someone on Monday and then I test them on Tuesday, are they going to score the same or are they going to score very different? If they score different, I know that there might be an error or a problem with my test because it's not reliable. Okay, so you can do it on different days, um, have two different administrators. Okay, so student A and student B are giving this test. Um, will I score the same if uh, I have one person administering the test compared to another? Um, so we use these most often in our motor skill tests, our physical attribute tests, to make sure that we have reliability within that measurement. Okay, when I administer the seated medicine ball throw, compared to when maybe my colleague administers it, does the same participant score similarly with both um, administrators or on different dates? Okay. With inter-class reliability, okay, we're looking at is the first trial and the second trial have very little change? Is there a giant effect from practice? Okay, if they practice that skill, do they get better at it? Just because they perform it once, do they perform better the second time just because they've done it before? Um, that could cause error. Um, we might have to change the way that we create this test because we know that once they've learned it or if they've done it before, they're going to score higher than someone who is not, regardless of maybe their physical abilities. It's just the skill of practice um, within the test. Okay, so here's an example. Okay, we have a personal trainer who wants to examine his clients physical fitness levels, and he wants to know if the tests that he gives to his clients are reliable. Okay, so in this case, we're going to do the sit-up assessment. You did that in your lab. Okay, the clients do as many sit-ups as they could on two separate days. So theoretically on day one and day two, they should score the same. You're not going to get better just um, because you've 
done some sit-ups doesn't mean that you're automatically going to adapt and be better at sit-ups. Um, but theoretically, that's the case, but we don't know. So we're going to test that. Okay, so day one, they, they perform the test. And then on day two, they perform another test. Um, if they have very different scores from day one to day two, we know that this test is not reliable because we're not getting a very similar consistent measurement from time point A to time point B. Okay, so in this case, we have 10 participants or, or 10 clients. Okay, we look at trial one, which say we do on Monday and trial two on Thursday separating it so there's no, no fatigue involved. Um, and then we calculate the correlation coefficient. Okay, so we calculate the R value using the same way we would calculate a Pearson product moment correlation. Um, and we assess what is this reliability. So looking at this R value, it's 0.927. Compare that to 0.8, which is our standard for good reliability. In this case, this test is reliable. We can say that this is a reliable test. The sit-up test is a reliable test, but does that mean that it's valid? Does that mean that it's a good test for muscular endurance of the trunk? This doesn't give us that information yet. Okay, right now, we just know that it is reliable. Okay, reliability does not mean validity. Validity does not mean reliability. They're separate, but we need both of them to have a high-quality test. Okay. Um, so here's another example. Here's one of equivalence reliability, looking at two different forms or two different assessments to see if they are consistent. Um, so we have an instructor who's concerned about cheating on their test. Okay, so she develops two equal forms. Okay, so two exams that are different but assess the same qualities um, or the same knowledge. And it's distributed to half the class get one and then half the class gets the other exam. Okay, so we have these two exams and we want to know, are they reliable? Okay. We want to know if the two forms are going to give us the same analysis of knowledge. Is it going to measure knowledge the same? So are they going to do well on test one and are they going to do well on test two? Or if they do poorly on test one, are they also going to do poorly on test two? Okay. So, um, First, we would create a large um, set or those questions that are equal to each other or equal in knowledge um, or address the same topics. They're going to take one test and then later on, they're going to take the second test. It okay, will randomize it so that we don't have someone, everyone's taking test one, then test two. Some will, will split it half and half, create a randomization there. Um, and then find the correlation between the scores on each exam to determine reliability. So say here are our questions. We're going to randomly assign half and half um, <clears throat> and then see how the students do. Okay, we're looking at the equivalence between the two of these students, say seven students, test one and test two, and we want to know are they reliable or am I going to get a consistent measurement from test one to test two? Okay. Um, most of the time with equivalence, we're going to use split halves reliability um, compared to using two completely different exams, um, using odd and even portions and comparing those um, just for time's sake, especially in a classroom setting, your students aren't going to want to take the same test twice or a similar test twice, um, but you can split it up and, and assess it one year and then use the splits the next year as a way to um, have different portions or different questions, uh, but still achieve the same measurement of knowledge, which is the point of a written exam. Um, so we would create an assessment okay, with a large number of questions. Okay, they would address the same qualities, randomize those questions, and then compare the scores on odd questions compared to the scores on even questions to determine if they are reliable. Um, so if question one and question two both assess knowledge on um, evaluation. Okay. Do those who score well on question one also score well on question two? Okay. Um, so normally we'll do this for longer tests and they're normally more reliable than shorter tests because it takes in more information. Okay. The more information we have, normally we have a better chance of um, determining this reliability. 
Okay, so say we have a 40, 40 question test, we get 20 questions odd, 20 questions even, and maybe one and two, three and four, five and six are, are measuring the same qualities. Um, and we wanna know, do those students who score well on question one also score well on question two or score well on the odd questions, do they also score well on the even questions? And we would do the same thing, we would calculate our reliability using our Pearson product correlation. And in this case, um, we have an R value of 0.64, okay, which tells us that uh, this is probably not a, or a reliable exam or a reliable split because that number is below 0.8. Okay. There are differences between reliability of different types, so equivalence and split halves. Okay. Equivalence reliability has two different types of questionnaires. Um, Split halves is just one questionnaire, but we're splitting the questionnaire in half. Okay. Equivalency, we have two different types or two different tests, split halves, only one test. Equivalency, we're looking at um, scores on two separate exams compared to just maybe the odd and evens. Um, but we're still, we're still performing the same correlation test. So it's more on how we administer these two tests compared to, or these, how we administer the assessment that we're going to test the reliability on. Um, are we going to use one questionnaire? Or are we going to take one large questionnaire and split it in half? Um, so it depends on your time constraints, depends on your um, abilities, uh, your population, um, but they're both options for those of you who are especially in the, or going towards education. These are things to think about when you're creating assessments. Okay, now we'll go into intra-class reliability. Okay, um, we're looking at the reliability of more than two trials or multiple trials. So think back to our ANOVA and okay, keep that in our head. Um, it allows us to estimate reliability for more than two trials. So maybe three trials, four trials, five trials. Um, are we reliable, reliable over time over multiple measurements? Okay, we do this by looking at the variance of scores. So think back to ANOVA. Okay, this is an ANOVA based calculation. Okay, we're computing this, the ratio of um, different variances or, or how each variance is causing differences within the scores. Um, so a score or a test with very large variance is not going to be very reliable. One with very small variance is going to be reliable. Um, so we do this by using the Cronenbox alpha coefficient. Um, you're not going to have to calculate it for your exams or anything, but we just want to understand how we could assess reliability on a larger scale or using more measurements. Okay, so remember we look at all of the different types of variants. Um, so we use um, the amount of trials, okay, K is our number of trials, multiplied by the variance of those trials or the variance between those trials. Okay, so we say we have three different trials of a specific skill test and we'd wanna know over time or over multiple trials um, do we have a reliable exam or a reliable test? Okay, so we compute the alpha coefficient. Okay, so we're looking at the variance of the scores. Okay, and then we're looking at the variance between the scores. Um, similar to how we would do with an ANOVA. Okay, so we take each of those trials, um, find the variance of the trials, okay, and then look at the variance of the trials compared to the total variance to find the reliability. In this case, this is not a reliable test um, because our coefficient is very low okay, or is lower than 0.8. Okay, so what can affect this reliability? Okay, we can have fatigue. So fatigue generally decreases the reliability of a test because as someone fatigues, they change their abilities or they change their focus, they change their physical capacities. So if someone is fresh compared to someone who is fatigued or to a time point when they're fatigued, we're going to have different scores. Okay, we could have practice. Practice is going to change um, the reliability because if someone has never done a skill before compared to someone who has now practiced the skill or practiced the test, they're going to perform better or more favorably after they have had a practice round with the test. Um, often we combat this by doing a familiarization session where we teach them so everybody has the same amount of practice and then we perform the assessments after everybody's practice so we kind of 
level out the playing field. Okay. There could be also the time between testing. So reliability changes because every day you are slightly different based on the knowledge you get, um, the movements you do throughout the day. Okay, you're, you're slightly different every single day. And the longer the time points between tests or between times that the test is administered, the greater the variance between those tests. So it's, it's less re reliable the longer time point we get between tests. So if, say, for instance, we're doing a strength measurement. So on day one, we give you a strength measurement, and then we give you a strength measurement um, 12 weeks later. We don't know what you've been doing between that time. You could be completely sedentary for those 12 weeks, and then you score lower, or you could have started training in those 12 weeks, and then you get stronger. Okay, you're a very different person over those two time points because it's such a long period of time between tests. Okay, we can look at environmental conditions. Okay, if, if noise changes, um, heat changes, so how someone performs in the heat compared to the cold, um, different lighting. Okay, these are all ways that we can, or the environment may change, so keeping a consistent environment will give you a more reliable test. Okay, we can look at difficulty level for the subjects. Um, so if a test is too easy, um, they may get extremely better over time. If it's too difficult, they may not be able to successfully achieve the test the same way, um, which is going to affect our reliability. And then the precision of the measurement. So the measurement itself is going to dictate a lot of that reliability compared to, say, you're using a handheld stopwatch compared to um, electronic timing gates. Um, those two are going to give you very uh, or slightly different responses um, because now you have the influence or the error from the human aspect compared to um, the more consistent precise measurement from the timing gates. Um, so accuracy plays a role also. We can also look at the method of scoring or, or how we format a, maybe a subjective test. Um, how we organize that subjective test can change the reliability, especially between raters. Um, so two different raters, if, if one thinks um, more highly, one has different experiences, and they don't score on the same standard or they have different biases. So there may be more bias towards certain movements or bias towards different aesthetics. That can change that method of scoring. Uh, you could also have the administrative procedures. So how well you give the directions and the motivation of the subject. So if you have, say, one administrator who's very monotone, tells you the directions, go, 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 compared to someone who's really energetic. Come on, let's go, guys. We're going to go, 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 go. It gives you more clear directions. You're going to have very different responses. We know that especially in strength measurements or maximal exertion measurements, the more verbal motivation we give, the better the score. Um, so by standardizing that and giving the same amount of motivation or the same amount of feedback um, and kind of how you're, you're helping motivate your subjects, can change um, those scores or influence those scores and influence then the reliability. Um, so consistency in how you administer the test can help to improve your reliability. Okay, so where are some other um, common sources of error? Okay, because error does change our reliability. If we have more sources of error, we're going to have less reliability. So cheating, okay, someone's maybe it's practice, maybe it's on a test and they're cheating, that's not going to reliably assess knowledge if they cheat on one test and don't cheat on the other. Um, instrument accuracy, it gives us, we talked about that a little bit earlier, um, but how accurate that a measurement tool is, the more reliable the measurements themselves. Okay. Individual variability, okay, some people with more skill, less skill, more physical capacity, less physical capacity can change the reliability based on the test. Um, the testing conditions like the environment or if it's being recorded or not, okay, um, or how you're recording. Um, so if you do have a recording, it's going to influence motivation, it's going to influence um, how someone may perform a task or perform some kind of test, written test, um, and also how you record the session um, can give you, or how the administrator records the session, uh, as in for subjective tests, can cause different errors because of biases, um, mood, all of those other um, psychological variables. Okay, lastly we'll talk about objectivity okay, um, or inter-rater objectivity or inter-rater reliability looking at between multiple different administers do we have reliability 
of giving that measurement, even though a different person is administering the test. Um, so there is going to be some disagreement or there's going to be some difference between people because they have different biases, especially in subjective tests um, or subjective sports, things like diving, gymnastics, um, bodybuilding, physique, you know, all things that have a, a subjective judge score where they view based on their view, based on some criteria, they give the final verdict um, rather than an objective sport like sprinting where you have a stop start. Um, that's a very objective test because there's no influence of, of who's administering the test. Um, but there is subjective measurement, subjective judgments can have less objectivity or more objectivity depending on the people. Um, you also see this in um, subjective tests of physical capacity within the workplace. Um, so physical therapists performing manual muscle tests. Um, that person's ability to administer the test, their experience with the test, or personal trainers, maybe you're looking at skinfold measurements, how reliable they are within that measurement, um, can also give different reliability within that test. Okay, so how would we examine if we have an objective test or we have objective observers? Okay, we can actually look at what's called inter-observer agreement or how well the observers score the measurement in the same way. Okay, so how well they agree on the same movement or the same outcome gets the same subjective score. Um, so we do this by looking at the number of agreements, agreements so the, the number of times that they score that movement or that expression the same way divided by the number of agreements plus the number of disagreements or the total number of available cases. Um, and we look at the kind of the ratio of their agreements to the total possible agreements or the disagreements plus the total agreements. Um, so say we have two judges and we wanna know, do they score the same and how often, what's their percentage that they score the same as the other observer? So. Here's an example, make this kind of makes a little bit more sense. Okay, we have a basketball head coach and they're trying to look at basketball performance to see who can start, who shouldn't start, who should play, who shouldn't. Um, so he creates a coded system. So he measures um, different aspects of basketball performance um, and wants to know if these measures are reliable between him, the head coach and the assistant coach. Okay, so are they observing the same thing and measuring it in the same way using this standard system or the system he created. So we look here, we have the head coach and the assistant coach, and we're looking at shots and scores, assists, blocks, rebounds, and steals. So these are um, different aspects of basketball performance. They watch the game and they want to track how often they see this occur within their team. Okay, so shots and score, um, head coach says six, assistant coach says six, that means that they agree on that same measurement. So they measured it the same. Within the same game, they measured the same amount of shots and scores. Look at assists, blocks, rebounds, and steals. We see that there's agreements except for an assists. The head coach said there were five assists, the, uh, or four assists, the assistant coach said there were five. So here we have a disagreement. So they did not score the same movement of the same outcome in that game the same way. So we would look at this as the total number of agreements, which in this case is four agreements, divided by four plus one, the agreements plus the disagreements, to get an inter-observer agreement of 0.8 or 80% agreement, which would be good objectivity. Um, so 80% is kind of our criteria, 0 0.8 is our criteria for inter-observer agreement. So if they agree 80% of the time, we know that we have an objective reliable test. Okay, so what can affect objectivity? Okay. The clarity of the scoring system is huge. If you're going to use this within your um, qual qualitative or your movement-based qualitative analysis project. So how clearly the scoring system is laid out. If it's very vague or open to interpretation, you're going to have less agreement or less reliability within observers. Uh, the more clear and concise exactly what needs to be done, what it is specifically, will give you more um, objectivity and reliability because now they're going to measure more similarly to each other. Um, we can look at the degrees of which they are 
accurately scoring what is what is correct um, in this case. So limiting bias, the more bias we have, the less objectivity and the less reliable that more subjective test would be. Um, and then we look at the training. The, the better the training, the better quality training that we have for the judges or those who are saying yes or no or scoring a 10 out of 10 or 8 out of 10, how trained they are, the ones who are more trained and more trained in specific scoring and, and knowing what to view and how that is scored, um, will have a more objective and reliable test. So this is where more of the human aspect comes in because objectivity is key in more subjective tests because um, measurements like um, distance, time, those are very objective themselves because it's not a person saying, yes, this was this, this was this. It's looking at a, a clear set criteria compared to this, which is more subjective based on their perception of what occurred. So we have to really measure and make sure we have objectivity there. All right, I'll see you in our next lecture.